Well, all 50 states are now at least partially reopened, and the CDC's guidelines for reopenings are out, albeit toned down from what the agency was originally looking to release, with a lot of suggestions in place of what used to be mandates and no advice at all for religious institutions. Still, the trajectory is clear, and suddenly, more of us are having to make our own decisions about what situations we want to put ourselves and our families in, what feels safe, how much it's worth sacrificing the other elements of our life. Of course, it's the older population that experts are still the most worried about, which we'll get to in a little bit. But there are growing concerns about kids these days, too. At the start of the pandemic, the conventional wisdom was that kids really weren't getting coronavirus, and if they were, the symptoms were mild. But increasingly, doctors abroad and here in the U.S. have been reporting cases of a new illness known as multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children, or MIS-C which they think is related to COVID-19 and can be life-threatening if it's not treated. Cases were first reported in Europe late last month, and last week, the CDC issued a nationwide alert after an influx of cases in New York where at least three children have died and roughly 150 have been diagnosed with the syndrome. Dr. Fauci of Coronavirus Task Force fame has also been urging people to take the risk to kids seriously as they consider reopening schools and daycares. And he pushed back during a Senate hearing last week against criticism from Senator Rand Paul, who argued it's time to reopen and that Fauci is not the be-all, end-all decision maker. I have never made myself out to be the end-all and only voice in this. I'm a scientist, a physician, and a public health official. I give advice according to the best scientific evidence. We don't know everything about this virus, and we really better be very careful, particularly when it comes to children, because the more and more we learn, we're seeing things about what this virus can do that we didn't see from the studies in China or in Europe. Some local hospitals have been starting to report some cases of missing kids, too, including at least a half dozen at Boston Children's, where doctors are now leading a nationwide CDC-funded study of the new syndrome. I'm joined now by Dr. Kevin Friedman. He's a cardiologist at Boston Children's Hospital and an assistant professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Doctor, good to meet you, and thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on the show. Doctor, before we get to Miss C, I mentioned a couple of minutes ago that for younger people who do get COVID-19, the symptoms are generally much milder. But correct me if I'm wrong, I, I don't understand why kids, young people, seem to be able to tolerate this deadly virus far better than kids, for the most part, are able to tolerate the typical seasonal flu. What's the reason? Yeah, we really don't know. It's, it's pretty amazing that, uh, at least from the initial data from China and the first wave of infections in the U.S., we saw very little disease in children. We thought children were largely spared, especially from the respiratory failure. And that still seems to be true from the respiratory failure in the acute phase. What's changed is now this emerging inflammatory syndrome, which is occurring later, uh, often three to six weeks after the initial exposure to COVID, is the emerging problem we've noted that does seem to be quite more prevalent in children than in adults. So what exactly is this syndrome for mere mortals like me? Explain it, please, if you would. Yeah, so it's, a, it's, an, it's a new syndrome that um, is characterized by high fevers for several days in a row and multi-system uh, organ dysfunction and inflammation um, with a hallmark lab pattern of severe uh, immune dysregulation with severe inflammation in the body, and it can affect multiple organs. So a lot of people have been comparing it to Kawasaki syndrome, which apparently are disease, which some people are aware of. Is that a helpful comparison? Is it a valid comparison? Uh, it is. I think, yeah, absolutely. I think it is. I think there's definitely patients who are presenting with this new inflammatory illness um, that have characteristic features of Kawasaki. So Kawasaki disease is part of the spectrum of the illness. The harder part, though, is that there's patients presenting even sicker than what a typical Kawasaki patient would, um, who don't, who fall in the, the other end of the, expe the spectrum of disease. So how does it work? Can you explain the connection? If the best that I understand is that the virus is believed to trigger an overreaction from a young person's immune system. Is that close to correct? Yeah, you, you stated that perfectly. Both Kawasaki, Go ahead. <laughs> Both Kawasaki disease and this new inflammatory condition seem to be um, triggered by a virus um, or another environmental exposure in the case of Kawasaki, and then the immune system kind of goes haywire or overboard, and that's what's leading to the symptoms. 
both based on the timing and the fact that most of these children are actually aren't testing positive for COVID by PCR, the acute test. We know this is likely mm -hmm. more of an immune response rather than a direct viral uh, effect. But do, are we even 100% certain that there is a connection? I know the, the, the growing body of conventional wisdom in your world is that there is, but are you convinced that there is that connection? Yeah, I'm convinced both because of the temporal um, time throughout Western Europe and because of the vast majority of these kids, now that we have serology testing, the antibody testing, are testing positive for IgG, indicating that they were exposed and mounted an immune response. So why do some kids who get COVID-19 uh, end up getting this Miss C and some do not? It's a great question that people are still trying to figure out. Um, it may be related to several factors, including the degree of exposure to COVID and then the um, genetic predisposition to form this type of severe immune response in children. That's the same exact thing people have always said in Kawasaki disease is why are certain children getting it when we're probably all exposed to the same um, potential viruses out in the world. So are there, other, are there down, other, other, I'm sorry, go ahead. It probably boils down to the genetic response and the immune response that you're genetically predetermined to have. But in addition to the genetic predisposition, did I not read somewhere that uh, Asian American kids and uh, Afro Caribbean kids are more likely to get it? Is that correct? That's a great point, and, and that's completely unknown yet if that's mostly related to exposure or if it's actually the genetics. Um, and then in the, in the Boston area, we've actually seen it overwhelmingly in Hispanic children, which actually hasn't been reported elsewhere, but oh. children's were seeing it largely in Hispanic children. Why does it take so long to show up? I think because it's an immune response. It's not the acute virus. It's your body's response to the virus. Yeah, so it's, it's later. And that's why we've just so noticed it in the last few weeks when – Coronavirus has been prevalent in Massachusetts for at least a few months. So the bad news is, as I said, in some limited number of cases, it can be deadly. The good news is, from what I read and understand, is it is treatable if people recognize the symptoms and do access someone like you. So run down for us, if you can, what are the symptoms that parents should be looking for, doctor? Yeah, so I think it's high persistent fever is the hallmark. Um, and then um, patients who have are often presenting with some prominent uh, GI symptoms, including abdominal pain, diarrhea, and vomiting, as well as um, symptoms of Kawasaki disease, which include red eyes, rash, uh, swollen hands and feet, or lip or tongue changes. Kids who are very lethargic um, or having trouble breathing also would warrant close uh, and immediate attention. Um, so those would be the hallmark symptoms that would make me worried in addition to the fever. You know, I'm always looking for a silver lining in this multi-month dark cloud. Is it possible that when you and your colleagues do this work that we've been reading about, that we may learn not only more about this Miss C connection to COVID-19, but we may learn more about, gain more insight into COVID-19 itself, or is that false optimism? No, I think we're going to learn a lot about both COVID and then um, in our field, Kawasaki disease has been a disease we haven't figured out the cause despite it being recognized for 50 years. And I think this is a, a rare opportunity, although in an unfortunate circumstance, to learn more. Can we uh, talk about a related thing for the final minute or, or so here? The other day, I, I saw some numbers out of New York City that I'm going to put up on the screen. It was comparing March to May of 2019 to March to May of 2020 in terms of vaccination rate in New York City. I thought these were staggering. Uh, vaccination rates for kids uh, two and younger down 42 percent. Kids three and older in New York City down 91 percent. Now, I am assuming that that's because people are staying at home. They're afraid to go to the doctor or, or, or whatever. You're nodding in agreement. What are you doing about it? Because the, the good news is they're staying at home, protecting themselves from the risk of COVID-19, but putting themselves at great risk of what? I don't know, meningitis, measles and all these things. What are you doing about it? Yeah, it's a huge problem, both in adult and pediatric medicine, of people not seeking normal care, not having available care, uh, normal available care. Uh, and I think for vaccines, it's a little bit easier because most of them you can catch up in the coming months um, in terms of the children's exposure. Um, but we, it, it's a big problem in terms of uh, medicine globally that patients are seeking care both later or not at all and showing up in much more severe uh, forms of disease. So when a parent calls you and says, it's time for my child's, I don't know, measles vaccination, but I'm frankly, I'm scared to bring him or her into a hospital. 
uh, or a doctor's office, what do you say to them? I think with appropriate precautions, wearing a mask, uh, good hand washing, uh, and social distancing, the risk is actually incredibly low. I've been coming to the hospital every day for two months, and it's, it's, it's been very, you know, things are much different and much more controlled. So I think the risk is very low. And as we phase back and reopen, pe- part of that is going to be going back to routine medical care. And that's going to be a gradual process, but it's, it's a necessary one for reasons like you showed with the, the really astounding decrease in vaccinations over the last few months. I hope that process does move along pretty quickly. Dr. Friedman, thank you so much for your insight and your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me.